Hey everyone, welcome back. Uh, this video is going to be all about, you know, working with uh, the MATLAB workspace. So how variables are sort of stored, how we can pass them in and out of scripts, how we can, uh, words, how, how the, uh, how we can save and export a workspace, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I'm breaking up this chapter into two parts, at least that's the plan as of filming right now. The first part is just going to be talking about the uh, the workspace and how we can use the workspace in order to import and export from script files. So I have my MATLAB screen up right now and you can see I have my command window and my workspace. So what the workspace is, we haven't really talked about it yet other than, hey, it shows the uh, it shows the values that we have for all of our uh, variables that we've defined. Well, the workspace really is just a collection of all the variables that we've defined and their values. So it collects that, hey, well, the variables I have are ants, b, d, f, g, x, but it also tells us that, well, it's a, I've associated the value blah with ants, the value uh, 2342 with b, the value 123 with d, and so on. So that the workspace is sort of those collections of associations. You can think of it as that. And if you don't have this workspace window up, some easy ways of checking what is in the workspace are who and whose. So who just gives you the names of all of the values here. And whose, as we've talked about before, it gives you a lot more description about each of the variables. So the names, the actual sizes of those variables, what type of data is contained in them, and the size in memory, which is a conversation we may or may not have. I honestly don't remember if we talk about it that kind of stuff right now. All right, so after that quick example or that quick discussion of the workspace, what I want to do is I want to give just talk a little bit about defining variables. So what we have here is we have a script file that just takes the average of three numbers, x, y, and z, which I have predefined in the script as we are pretty used to. And then I'm just I'm just taking the average of those. So summing them all up and dividing them by three. And if I run this, we will get a expected average if the uh, average of those three numbers, if you were expecting 136.6667 to be the average of those three numbers. So that all works well and good. And what I can do in here is I can try to change the values of x, y, and z. So I can say, let's say x equals 10,000 or something like, like that. So that should throw the average way off. if. If, if indeed this uh, new value of x applies. And what we see here is that when I run it again, it doesn't change at all. So what's happening is that, yeah, I set x to be 1,000 in here, and when I set x to be 1,000, you'll see that x changes in the workspace up here. But when I run the script, oh, pardon me, when I run the script, then x gets reassigned a new value, negative 23, and then the whole calculation happens with the value of x being negative 23. But what happens when I don't actually define x, y, and z? So now, rather than defining x, y, and z in the script file, what if we define x, y, and z in the command window? Now what happens here, I'm going to clear out the command window and everything here. So I'm going to do... This time we'll do negative 5, 27, and 200. Uh, and, oops, sorry, x equals negative 5, y equals 27, z equals 200. I promise I'm totally not doing this because I forgot the old values of x, y, and z. Now, what you might expect would happen is that MATLAB throws a hissy fit because x, y, and z haven't been, have not been uh, defined in this script yet. But when we run it, it actually does calculate the average correctly of x of this x, y, and z. So the values of x, y, and z in the command window carry over to the uh, in uh, in the script when it is run. The reason why is because we defined it in the command window before we ran the script. So if I do a clear of all the variables and then try running the script again. then it has the hissy fit because we haven't uh, defined x, y, and z. So this script working 
is completely contingent on us having defined X, Y, and Z before we actually run the script. So the reason why is because the script window and the command window share a common, what we like to call environment. So the environment is sort of, you could think of it as a, a fancy word for the workspace. It basically has all of the values that are currently like that, that we're currently looking at along with a, a whole bunch of other fancy things like built-in functions and built-in variables like pi, stuff like that. So what's going on here is that we add values to the workspace or we add them to the environment by typing them in here. So now let's do x equals 23, y equals 47, z equals negative 1000, and then run the uh, script again. So we define these, we then call the script. The script still sources from the same workspace as the command window, and it's able to produce a result like so. So this is a really good way of providing what we call input into a script. Now, input basically means that the script requires values that are need to be given to it from outside of the script. So we're sort of inputting these values into the script. And you can sort of think of the, um, when we call a function, say, if you're trying to do log 10 of 45, 45 is the input for the function log 10. So by passing in the argument 45, we are giving uh, log 10 the input of 45. Of course, I log 10 is not the name of the function because I it completely slipped my mind. My bad. It is very late at night as I am recording this, so my apologies. So there's one more way of giving input into a script, and that's through this input function right here. So input it gives a, it basically what it does is it will take the message, the string message that you put in here, and it actually displays this in the command window. And whatever whatever values that are passed in in the command window are then taken and assigned to the variable here. So what we're saying is we're saying, hey, MATLAB, display this message. What is the value for x to the user? And what the user will do is then give MATLAB a value, and then we're telling MATLAB, hey, once I give you a value, I need you to put this in a little box and name that box X or something like that. So we can actually run this and see what happens. So first the command window asks us, what is the value for X? Let's say negative 75. Cool. What is the value for Y? 208.3. Uh, seven. And the value for z, that's easy, it's negative five. And just like that, it takes those answers, it stores them in x, y, and z, and it performs the calculation for a, v, g. Now, something you might notice is that I actually put a space right here in between the question mark and the, and the uh, end of the string. The reason for me doing that is because if I don't, you'll see what happens. So let's rerun the script. If I don't do that, see how everything I type in actually shows up right after the question mark like this. Now, we don't want this to happen. Um, basically, it looks a lot nicer for the reader, and it, it looks a lot nicer just for anyone who's looking at your code if you put that space in between the question mark and the end of the string. So remember to always have that space when you're using the input command. So here's one more thing we can do, is we can actually type in arrays when we're asked for input. So what I have right here is the the uh, function is asking the user to give an array of numbers right here. So if I run this and we actually give it an array, now we'll we'll define it the normal way we define a MATLAB array, which is we'll type in numbers. So 25, negative 37, 40, uh, 28, I guess, uh, 57, uh, 906 point three. And it's actually going to give the average of all of those values. So being able to type in an array is actually super useful. And, and it's actually really flexible too, because it allows you to write functions that don't rely on specific numbers of values. Now, you'll remember that in the last in the last example that I did, my, uh, my script, uh, I said functions, I meant script for the time being, but my script, what it did was it... Um, it expected 
three numbers specifically named X, Y, and Z. Or I guess in the last version, it expected specifically three numbers. But using an array like this, you see in this one I use five. I could use as few as one or as many as, uh, well, as many as I could probably think of without getting too bored or hungry. So doing something like this, uh, let me actually type in a few more values. So I'll do this, uh, one, two, negative 59, like that. This makes, this lets us do really flexible solutions and making our code as flexible as possible, able to handle as many, or as large of a size of arguments as possible without restricting the user and without us having to do like a whole bunch of redundant work to define our functions for, okay, let's say one argument, two arguments, three arguments, etc. This makes things a lot easier both for us and the people who are trying to use our code. So in short, it's really helpful for us to have features like these when we're working in that lab. All right, so let's talk output. What I mean by output is that, well, output is really everything that MATLAB gives. It, it sort of prints out into the command window here. So let's say if you're talking about this message here, give an array of numbers, this is output to the command window. Furthermore, so is the value of AVG right here. That is a output to the command window as well. So right now we have two ways already that we know about of how to output something. So if we say something like x equals 10 without doing a semicolon, you know, y equals 37, z equals negative 24, Commands like these, where we assign a variable to something, is a form of output. Or if we just write something like sqrt of 4 without doing a semicolon, that will also output. The other way that we have of providing output to the command window is this display function, which I imagine most of you have used in your labs already. So the display function basically takes the value, or takes some value, and outputs it to the command window. So let's take a look at that. Right here you can see x, y, and z, all of those have been output uh, in the form, you know, x equals and then this value down here. And then we have ants equals 2. This was the answer of the square root of 2 up here. And of course I have to give an array of numbers, so I'll, I'll just type in 35. And now the value of average, 35, is output below this. So these are all ways of providing output. However, there are some limitations. For example, when we're doing all of these outputs, they tend to clutter up the um, they tend to clutter up the screen pretty badly. Furthermore, you can't really just output anything. In this case, you're outputting the what a, uh, the value that a variable is set to. In this case, you're value you're outputting the output of a function. Uh, let me get rid of those for now. And when you're working with display, I can't say. Uh, let's say I'm actually doing x equals five. If you're working with display, you can't display both average and x in the same command. And what happens here, uh, 35 again, what happens here is MATLAB gets mad because it's expecting you to only pass in one single argument. So display takes in exactly one argument and it displays the value of that argument. We can sort of work around this by displaying them as a vector. If we do this, uh, 35 again, then we have something. But the problem with this is that it doesn't really give us a very good description of what exactly is being output. So in a much more complicated script, you could probably imagine that uh, that giving the um, that giving the value of a whole bunch of different things at once without really being making it clear to the user what is being output can be a little bit tricky. So luckily, MATLAB actually gives us some really cool functions to deal with this. So the function that we're going to take a look at today is the fprintf function. And if you've had the uh, displeasure of working with C before, you will recognize this. But basically fprintf is, it, it comes from the name, it, it comes from the name of a very commonly used function in the C programming language, which is one of the older programming languages. It's a very commonly learned programming language in terms of, you know, what computer scientists learn and Likely, that's really what uh, that's that's likely what uh, inspired this name among a few other things in MATLAB. So, fprintf 
Basically what it does, it's a really advanced printing function. In other words, it's a really advanced function that lets you get some very nicely formatted outputs into the command window. So we'll go through it pretty slowly. Um, it will take us a while to really get to the full uh, utility of fprintf. So let's start out with something simple. So what I have right here is I'm asking MATLAB, I'm basically telling MATLAB fprintf the string no values declared. And what that's going to tell MATLAB is, hey, take the string that's inside of fprintf and display it in the command window down here. So let's take a look at this. So I've run the scripts, chapter four, part one, S1. Uh, script one is what that stands for. And what it has is no values declared, and then it has the two arrows after it. And when I start typing in the next command, it's on the same line as no values declared, which is not exactly fun. You know, it looks, for one, it looks pretty ugly, but that's not the least of the problems. Um, it's going to make things really cluttered and kind of gross, honestly. So what we want to do is we want to tell MATLAB, hey, I want you to type out no values declared and then basically press enter in order to get the uh, the next command onto the next line after no values declared. So let's see what happens. I'm going to press the enter key right here and press run. And we have another problem. This time MATLAB's getting mad because there's no termination of this character vector. In other words, we need to have we need to have a uh, ending single quote on the end of this line. So we need a new way. And this is a problem that has plagued programmers for as almost as long as we've been programming using English text like this. So our remedy is to use a uh, a special character in order to do that. The uh, what we like, what we do is we use a uh, backslash like this. That's the one above the enter key on most uh, U.S. American keyboards. So we do a backslash n. And what this is, what this is right here, is what's called an escape character. So it's a special character that tells the computer, "I want you to press, basically to press enter. I want you to insert a new line right here after declared." So the, backsl the backslash right here tells the computer, hey, it, I'm about to type in a special character, so start listening for that. And then the N specifically tells you, I want you to insert a new line. So let's see what happens when, when we run it now. And as you can see, that new line was entered. So when a computer is reading through the string, it's actually going to read this new line symbol, the slash N symbol, and say, okay, this is what a new, it, it's what a new line character looks like to it, basically. So when we see a, uh, a physical space put down on the, in the uh, text like this, a computer instead sees a slash n. So that's how we can tell the computer to put in a new line. Now there's a few other cool escape characters that you can use. Um, one of them is the uh, horizontal tab. So if we put a slash t, T for tab right here. Then we'll do no, and then a tab, and then values. It doesn't matter that there's not a space between T and V right here because the when the computer is looking interpreting a special character, it only looks at the character directly after the backslash. So if we run this, you'll see the tab show up between no and values like that. Another cool one you can do is slash B, which is for backspace. So what this should do is basically the computer the computer will read, okay, so I'm going to type out declared and then, oh, well, they asked for a backspace and so I'm going to get rid of that last D. So the backspace, this uh, slash B character actually tells the computer when it's, uh, when it's trying to render out the text that you printed, okay, get rid of the last character. And as you can see, that last D was, was uh, removed because of the slash B right there. Now the same issue that we had with uh, not when we didn't include a slash n at the end of the last fprintf of a command, we'll still have that same issue right here, where if we don't specifically put a slash n after every fprintf, then the the program is going to assume that you don't want to start every uh, print statement at a new line. So what I mean by this is, notice how there's not a slash n here, but there is a slash n here. I'll get rid of the space because it doesn't do anything. And if we run it, you can see that there's no 
there's no uh, new line between the declared and X right here. So if we want to change that, if we want to make it look better, we can put a slash N here. And now the next uh, the next F print F output goes onto the next line. So whenever you want your output to go to, go to a different line, you want to put a slash N after it. Now, something we can actually do is we can put a slash n in the middle of a string. So we can say x declared slash n, x has a value of 3, like so. I'll put another slash n at the end. And just like this, we have a, uh, we have a new line inserted between declared and x right here. So this is exactly what we want in this case. All right, now what I've done here is I have slightly changed the script. Basically, I put a blah after this three right here, and you'll see why in a hot second. But what I have is I have f print f basically putting out that x has a value of three. All right, now let's change the uh, value of x right here and run this again. And well, the problem is, is that the script is still saying that x has a value of three. So of course, what that means is we have to update this in the string every time we want to change x. Now let's say something like, we'll actually define x ahead of time. So now let's say x equals five, and we'll re uh, we'll rerun the script. That's a problem. So now we need to go back in the script and change it. But now, okay, well, what if we want x to be equal to negative thirty-two? That's another problem because now we have to go back and change it, and so on. And what if someone else is looking at the code. What if you have written code like this to submit to me and I'm trying to check that your code works by checking different values of X and I'm not there to say, oh, well, I'm supposed to change this. I'm supposed to change the value of X in the string right here. That's problematic. What we need is we need a way to actually tell MATLAB, hey, put the actual value of X in this position right here. And there is a way to do that. So F print F the the last f in the, the last f in print f print f uh, stands for formatting. So what we're doing is we're actually able to format this string in a really fancy way. So what we can do is we can put a percent oh, we can put a percent f oh, percent f right here, and then after we put that percent f we'll give a second argument to f print f, which is x. Now I'm gonna, let me break this down for you. Let, let, let's see what's going on. So this percent f right here, f print f is going to go through and examine the string. It says, okay, well, there's a slash n, so I need to insert a new line there. That's easy. Oh, well, here's a percent f. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reserve some space in this string that I'm constructing for a number value. And when I see that number value, I'm going to insert it here instead of percent f. And this is, okay, let's uh, let's finish up looking through the string and all that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we have a lot at the end. Okay. And then it sees that there's a new argument. It says, okay, I have this value x right here. It checks x is a numerical value. So it's gonna say, all right, well, I'm going to insert this in the space that I reserved for a numerical value back here. So it takes x, x's value, it removes the percent f, and it puts in x's value. So if we say again that x equals negative 32, and then we run the script, just like that, we have 32 printed out in the string. Uh, of course, it's printed out as a flow, and I did also forget a slash n, but it totally works. So if I say x equals 500, and rerun the script, look, it updates again. So that's perfect. That's exactly what we want, is to um, update the script whenever the value of x changes here. OK, well, here's something else you might notice, is that we have way too many decimal points here. There is no reason for us to need six decimal points for just 500. And let's say that any number we're going to pass into x has no requires no more than two decimal points. Well, fprintf actually gives us a way of working with that. So we can actually specify the number of decimal points we want after the zero, which is super nice. So if we do 
0.2 f like this, what this is going to say is the number after the decimal point here is actually going to control how many how many values are after the decimal point when we print out the numerical value of x. So now x is still 500. If I run it again, it, now it's only going to display 500.00. If I do 0.0 like this, now it just says 500. If I do 11, let's say I want something really precise, that's a lot of decimal points. That's exactly what we need. It's perfect. So I'll keep it at 2 for now, like this. Now here's another thing. Uh, now x is 500, so we have this type of string length. Let's say now that we have x equals 1, 10,000, let's say 10 million. Why not? And if we run the script again, you can see how much longer this string is than this string. Or if we say something like uh, x equals 32, and then p4, uh, sorry, chapter 4, part 1, s1, like that. And let's compare this to uh, x equals 500 really quick. We can see the differences in the length of the string right here. So let's say we're building, I don't know, we're building like a table or something like that. We want to we want to print out a table using strings and we want all the values to line up. Well, fprintf has something for that too. We can do something like put a put the number of spaces that we want fprintf to allocate for the number to fill up. So let's say we put an 8 right here. What this is going to do is it's going to allocate 8 characters for the string. And then if it fills up those eight characters, you know, it's going to cut off at a certain point. But if it doesn't fill up those characters, in this case, it will write justify the values. So what it's what it means is that it's going to count how many characters are needed. Let's say to print 500. So one, two, three, four, five, six. It needs six characters. So what it'll do is it'll put in two spaces and then the six characters needed to write out 500. So let's take a look at this. Just like that, we have the two spaces plus the third because I put one between of and the number. But we have these two spaces and we have the six characters here to write out 500. And if we do the same thing for um, x equals 32, as you can see, the last digit of these values here line up. So these last zeros are put in place but we have all of these spaces before 32. So this has actually allowed us to allocate specifically eight values here. If we want to make it beefier, we can make it 10. So that pushes everything out a little bit further like that. What if you want it left justified? That's fine. We can do left justified. Check this out. Boom. I put a minus in front of it. Why does the minus mean that it's left justified? I don't know. You'll have to take this take that up with the creators of C. They made a bunch of wacky decisions. They deserve to live by their sins. This is fine. Anyway, it's totally normal for me to be mad about this. I promise. So let's run this. Now we have a left justified 500, a whole bunch of spaces, and a blah. I'll do this again with 32. We have a 32, the same, a whole bunch of spaces, and we have blah in the same point as 500. So it totally works. What if? What if you're super, you're super wild? You want it right justified, but you don't just want spaces in front of it. Oh, no, no, no. You want a whole bunch of zeros in front of it. Because that's wild. I don't know why anyone would want this, but this is totally an option in MATLAB. Because you can put a whole bunch of zeros in front of your 32 like this. So uh, I guess if you want to do that, that's fine. Maybe if you're like trying to make a sort of uh, cash register type of thing or something, it's useful to have all the zeros in front of it. Uh, here's a quick experiment. Let's put a negative zero in front of it, see what happens. It, nothing happens when you put a negative zero in front of it. The negative applies first before the zero. So anyway, yeah, that's uh, the f that's where the last f comes in in f print f, is that it, it comes in because it, you're basically taking strings and you're formatting them. And you can actually do this with multiple things. Um, so in one string. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate these out into two different strings. So x has a value of 0.10f, and then let's say 
y has a value of, and I'll do another percent 10.2f like this. We'll do x and y. So now let's say I'm going to do this uh, y equals 40. Run the script. And you can see that what we've done is we have the same, uh, we, we have put uh, x and y both of their values into the string. So you're actually allowed to do as many variables as you want, as opposed to display the, the disp function where you can only do one variable. This actually actually lets you do as many variables as you could probably conceive of doing. So fprintf is actually a multiple argument, or what we call a variable argument function right here. It takes a variable number of arguments, and depending on the number of arguments and how many uh, percent, you know, these uh, formatting things you put in here, it uh, puts those values into the string. So it's super helpful. Of course, what that means is you need to have as many arguments over here as you have percent signs like this. And if you do it wrong, if you have too many uh, percent signs or too few percent signs, or if you just try to use the percent symbol, then bad things are going to happen. For example, if I do something like, um, let's say uh, Iris is 110% sleepy. You have to be careful about this. See, it just ends like this. And MATLAB actually gives this error. The format not might, might not agree with the argument count. So when you have a percent symbol like this, when you have a percent symbol like this, everything after it sort of just gets ignored because fprintf is like, oh, I cannot handle this anymore. I'm, I'm done with this. So be careful about your percents. And if you want to actually type in a percent, I believe it's percent percent like this instead of a string. Yeah, if you type in percent percent, it actually give, types out the percent character. So that's something that's really useful if you want to type in percentages in your string. So do keep that in mind. All right, so you might be wondering, well, do I have to always put percent %f or can I do other things? And the answer is, is that you can do other things. So what I have in the script is sort, sort of a display of some of the other things you can do. Now, feel free to pause this video as much as you need, take a screenshot, copy down the code yourself, whatever. Um, but remembering these, um, remembering these letters and what they do, uh, we call these flags, by the way, the uh, percent, everything after the percent is, is what's called a flag. So every, every letter used in these flags has a unique and pretty useful purpose. So from top down, if you want to use exponential notation, you use uh, E in your flag, lowercase e, and that will do it in the form of little e plus 33. So this is saying 1 times 10 to the 33rd power, or 10 to the 32nd power is what I have up here. Uh, if you do big E like this, it, it outputs uh, exponential notation just the same, except now the E in the exponential notation is capitalized. So now this is 1.7823 times 10 to the first power. Now here's percent %f, which is what we've been using, and it's called, it stands for fixed point notation. Basically what that does is it displays everything before the decimal points and then up to six uh, up to six decimal points after, unless you do something like a 0.1f uh, or something like that. So by default, it does all of the values before the decimal point like this, and then up to six decimal points after. Now you'll notice this is supposed to be 10 to the, it's supposed to be 10 to the 33rd power, or sorry, one to the 33rd power of 10. Um, this is not one times 10 to the 33rd. It's a very, very severe approximation of one times 10 to the 33rd. The reason why it, it comes down to that whole computers are not the best at keeping track of numbers thing. When you use floating point notation, you're subject to a lot of inaccuracy once you get to really big or really small numbers. So if you're working with really big or really small numbers, something like, a, you know, in the 30s, the powers in the 30s, power in the 20s, maybe even 10s, you want to be careful about using fixed point notation. Basically, 
unless your number is pretty manageable, like unless you feel comfortable counting to your number, um, I would not use fixed point notation for it. And the same goes for decimal points is that you shouldn't use it for really small decimal points. Uh, fixed point notation is pretty dangerous. So for X, you can see, you know, why it can be really dangerous because of these really hard, um, these really hard estima estimations that it's doing. With Y, you can see that it's a lot more manageable. It just tacks on a few extra zeros on top of that. And using the uh, decimal point notation in your flag that we talked about just now, you can tweak how many decimal points you want in your answers, just everything you want. Now, what we have here is X in the shorter of exponential and fixed notation. So basically, it's going to count the number of characters it takes to write X in exponential notation, and it'll count the number of characters it takes to write X in fixed notation. So this right here is uh, 2 plus 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 characters to write X in exponential notation. Um, I don't want to count this. Uh, if anyone wants to tell me what this is, be my guest. I'm not counting that. This is clearly shorter. So it will display X in exponential notation. And it actually does a uh, solid and removes some unnecessary uh, decimal points after the exponential notation. So it has that going for it as well. And for Y, uh, what I did here is I used the, uh, the capital G here instead of the lowercase g. The lowercase g, if it displays exponential notation, it will use a lowercase e. The uppercase G will choose between the shorter of exponential and fixed notations, but if it uh, if it does choose exponential, then it will display an uppercase E. So we can actually change this to uppercase G, and we'll see that this here changes to an uppercase E. That's really all the the only difference that it makes is a uh, purely visual one. So in this case, Y is displayed as a fixed point notation because it it, it takes less characters to display Y in a fixed point notation than it does in exponential notation. And then what we have is x and y as an integer. So uh, an integer is basically a, an integer is a, a decimal point, or sorry, a number without decimal points, or at least it's supposed to be a number without decimal points. As you can see right here, uh, nothing changed in terms of how y is displayed because y is a you know is a number with decimal points so you can't display it, matlab doesn't display a number with decimal points without decimal points so if we really want to display an integer let's say z equals uh, 32 i'm going to show you the difference between displaying z as fixed point and as an integer so f print f uh, z as a fixed point uh, that will be percent f slash n z and f print f z as an integer. Oh, I should make this a string. Z as an integer uh, percent i slash n z. If we do this, you can see that when we do the fixed point notation that it gives z the normal decimal points. And if we wanted to make it not give z decimal points, we would have to put a point zero in front of it. But if we just type in i instead of f, if we display z as an integer, as a number without decimal points, basically, then you know MATLAB plays nice and actually displays it without including a decimal point or anything like that. So in short, with this one, it, an integer is a number without decimal points, and displaying an integer at using the uh, using i in your flag displays it without decimal points, without you having to tweak with uh, any of the other settings of the flag. All right, so here's something really cool about fprintf is that it can actually interpret matrix arguments. So what I have is I have x equals every integer, uh, the array containing every integer between 1 and 5 uh, inclusive. Uh, so every whole number, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, basically. Uh, y is going to be, it's going to take in all the values of x and give us a new array with the square root of all those values of x. And then I'm making this matrix t with uh, every the first column being the values of x and the second column being the values of y. So this I'm actually taking this straight out of the textbook here, um, minus uh, some changes in the fprintf message here. But what's going on with fprintf is that it's going to see this array. It's going to say, okay, this is a two-dimensional array. It has two columns. 
I have two flags in here. So when I see these flags, I'm going to replace each flag with a column of whatever row I'm working on. So we'll start with the first row and say, okay, well, when the integer is first row, first column, which in this case will be one, then its square root will be first row, second column, which is the square root of one, which is one. Then it'll go down to the next row, which so they will say, okay, well, now the integer is two. So its square root will be the square root of two, 1.41 blah. So we can actually check this out for ourselves by running the script. And as you can see, it has everything just the way we intended to. So fprintf is actually really smart in MATLAB and that it actually interprets an array as saying, okay, well now I need to just, I just need to call this command for everything for all the, over all the rows in this matrix. And for all the columns in a specific row, I can apply those columns to a, uh, to each of these flags are here. And actually the supplying the columns and applying the rows business is pretty similar to how fprintf works normally when we just pass in a whole number of arguments. So it takes all the arguments after the string and sort of converts them into a matrix and then applies and then just handles the matrix one row at a time, substituting in every column for every flag. So this is actually the default behavior. It's just more obvious that we're working with a matrix now. So it's really cool stuff. fprintf f is especially powerful in MATLAB. So we'll be using this pretty much for the rest of the quarter to handle our output. Now, something else that fprintf can actually do is it can actually create, it can actually print two files in your computer. So what I've done is I have basically written out the command to open up a new text file. So I'm going to clear CLC like this. What this is saying is, okay, f open is the function file open. What it's going to do here is it's going to open a file with whatever name I pass in here. In this case, I typed in blah.txt. Uh, .txt is pretty standard if you're just going to create a file that has simple text in it. And this w in quotes like this, this tells MATLAB that, hey, we are opening th this file with the intention of we're going to write to it. Now it actually does matter to MATLAB how you're trying to, like what you're planning on doing with the file that you're trying to open to. So if I did something like R, you're going to tell MATLAB, hey, I want to open the file and read the contents. If you do something like A, that's telling MATLAB, hey, I just want to read from the file and write to it. Uh, generally, it's simpler to use W if you're trying to write to the file and R if you're trying to read from the file. Uh, other really nice ones are W+, which tells MATLAB, hey, I don't, because, okay, let me just put it this way. When I do W like this, if blah.txt doesn't already exist, it's going to create blah.txt and start writing to it. Otherwise, if blah.txt does exist, then it'll just open the existing file and just overwrite everything. Uh, also, sorry, a, a brief correction. I totally mis misspoke. If you're doing A like this, what A does is it's going to, if the file of blah.txt doesn't exist, it will create a new file and work exactly like write does. But if blah.txt does exist, it's going to open that file and append everything you add to the file to the end of the file. However, if I do w and blah.txt does exist, then it's going to completely delete everything currently in blah.txt and start writing the file all over again. So now I can do something like w plus if I don't want blah. Dot, it, what w plus means is that if blah.txt exists, you know, open it, overwrite it, do all the normal stuff. If blah.txt doesn't exist, then don't do anything and give me an error that says, hey, something went wrong, blah.txt doesn't exist. Similar things happen with R plus and with A plus, they basically function the same way as R and A, except for the fact that they give an error if blah.txt does not already exist. So what we're just going to do for this example is I just want to open it up uh, W like this. And let's say what I want to do, oh, by the way, FID is basically going to give you a, what's called a scalar value, or, you know, I, I guess we've already talked about scalar values. It's going to give you a number and that number is going to have a special meaning to the computer. 
that basically it's going to point to which file you're trying to work with. So you pass this FID into certain functions and the computer will know exactly which file you're talking about. So it's a unique identifier for the file you're working with. There's a lot of file IDs out there. Um, right now, we're just going to care about the ones that we're creating using fopen. So what you can do, now that we have this FID, now let's say we want to give the values of x, y, and z, whatever those might be in the workspace, to this uh, file right here. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to, um, I'm going to put in comments, saves the values of variables named x, y, and z to blah.txt, excuse me, to blah.txt, x, y, and z must be created in the command window. So having a description of what your script is doing like this is actually going to be really helpful. Um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say to file name given by user. So let's actually make this a little bit more fun. We'll say file name equals input. Uh, what file do you want x, y, and z to be saved to? So I'll do that. And that input will be saved in as file name. Then I'm going to use fopen on file name like this. And I'm going to tell fopen that we're trying to open this file in order to write to it. Then after this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a whole bunch of fprintfs. So we'll do fprintf. Um, and we'll do it as normal. So let's say x uh, percent, let's say percent f slash n. Actually, no, even better. Let's say percent g slash n. Oop, I can't type right now. And, you know, we'll type in, we'll pass in whatever x's value is. So that's all well and good, but when we just have f print f like this, it's going to automatically assume that we mean, hey, print this out to the command window. So what you actually have to do is you have to actually put the file ID that you get from f open as the first argument. So we'll do f id and then the string, and then whatever arguments that we're going to put in that get that replace the uh, flags in this string. So this is actually what the first f and f print f refers to. So the first f refers to the file ID of where you're trying to send the string, and then you are printing the string, and the last f refers to the formatting that you're going to do to transform the string to have whatever values you want in it. So that's the full meaning of f print f right there. So let's do the same thing for y and z. So f print f if id y percent g slash n y and f print f if id z percent g slash n z. Now we're almost done, but we have probably one of the most important steps in here, which is that we actually need to close the file. So you know when you're working on a paper, say, in Microsoft Word, and then Microsoft Word unexpectedly quits or your computer runs out of battery, and then all of a sudden everything's messed up, the world's on fire, Microsoft can't, re can't, can't recover your full document, it has some autosave from like two years ago that is trying to bring up stuff like that? Well, imagine this happening, but worse. And basically you need to always close your files, because otherwise... Either the computer just kind of drops it without closing it properly, which uh, causes a lot of bad things because it can't like finish up the text file properly and then all of a sudden you might get some weird kind of corruptions in there. Or the computer might just hold on to that file. It might just kind of keep it open forever and ever. And that's fine and all for a little bit, but if you keep on opening more and more and more and more files, well, the computer is going to ha need to keep more and more and more resources for those files. And then all of a sudden it has less resources to do things like run your code or watch whatever videos you're trying to watch or run your, run your web, web browser so you can submit your labs uh, two minutes before the deadline. Because I know there I always have students that submit labs two minutes before the deadline. Uh, don't do that, by the way. <laughs> That's a bad idea. So what you want to do 
in order to close your files, and you should always close your files. In fact, every time you type in F, FID equals F open something, I highly recommend you immediately type in F close FID after it, and then put everything that you're doing with the file in between F open and F close. So you don't be, so you make sure that you don't forget to close your files. And the other thing you should do is now let's say, okay, well now I need to say, let's let a equal two plus two display a and all that. We're not using our file for these computations with a. So what we should actually do is we should put everything that does, we, we only want everything that directly uses the file in between F open and F close. And we don't want to keep the file open for longer than we need. So now once we're done with the file, then we want to do our computations here. So let's take a look at what happens. Uh, I want the file name to be blah.txt, very original. Oops. It does not, it does not like that. Let's try saving it as a string, blah.txt. Ah, right. Okay, so a couple of things that are really important to point out is that when you're putting inputting in a string like this, you actually have to declare it as a string. And this has to do with input actually being able to take in, uh, take in arrays and stuff like that, is that you have to put in a string actually formatted like a string and that's really just because um, then MATLAB can interpret this as, oh, well, now I'm making an array of characters. My slip up was because of other programming languages handling things a little bit different. So that's my bad here. Uh, this last error was because I totally forgot to define X, Y, and Z. I totally forgot that I meant to uh, define them in the command window before. So let's say uh, X equals 38, Y equals negative 205.829. Z equals uh, 1.582 uh, times 10 to the uh, ninth. All right. So the result of this is we will run this again. I want it to be saved to blah.txt. And then everything happened. We can presume that everything happened because MATLAB didn't throw any errors and then correctly added up A and then displayed it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, so here you can see the results of saving everything to, you can see the results of saving everything to that file blah.txt. So you can see up here, I have blah.txt, that's the file name and we have all of our strings formatted exactly the way we want them. So in short, you can use fprintf to actually write strings to files, which is super useful as is, you know, as is everything else in this course, of course. So something else that's important to note is that whenever you open and save a file like this, by default, it's saved in the current working directory. So in this case, I mine is saved in my whole pathway down to my 231 work and then to the, the folder that I made for this lecture. But um, just note that wherever your current folder is, is where that file is going to be saved by default. So I think MATLAB offline likes to default to system32 for whatever reason. So if you try to open and save a file there, it's going to save to system32. So be careful about that. All right, so the last thing I would uh, that I would ask that you do uh, is to check out section 4.6 in the textbook. It starts at page 118, and it's a really good example of using fprintf to convey information about a word problem that you're working on to whoever might be, say, running your code afterwards. So I highly recommend you check that out. It's a, it's a good way of displaying output rather than just uh, printing out the value of a variable or of a table like what we did before. So what we did before can be a little bit hard to understand what's going on. fprintf actually allows us a lot more control in telling the user, hey, this is what data we're actually outputting and making it as clear as possible. And really that's the, that's the end goal of sort of what we want to do as programmers now of MATLAB is we want to write code that is 
usable, that is useful for people. So what we want to do is we want to automate the solving of different problems and make it as clear as possible, hey, this is exactly what you need to pass in to the code to make it work, and this is exactly what you're getting out of the code. This is what the code is doing for you, and th these are the answers that it's giving you. So fprintf is a really powerful tool in order for us to do that. Yeah, thank you for watching this.